Let's pray. Heavenly Father, ah, you are an amazing and gracious God. And, and Lord, we need compassion, and we desire compassion from you, Lord, and that's what you throw, throw our way through Jesus Christ, your grace and your mercy, uh, that we as sinners can stand righteous before you, uh, not by our own works, but through the accomplished work of Christ. And Lord, as we consider your word today, I pray that you would speak into our lives and into our hearts and draw us near to you uh, as we consider uh, the life and times of Abraham and the circumstances surrounding the events of his life, Lord. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, like, like every good Christian, I don't believe in, in consequences. I believe we have a sovereign God and um, that there's... When there are things that seemingly are coincidental, it is God at work. Um, but sometimes we miss it. Sometimes there's, there's things that God doesn't just kind of surprises us. And a lot of times we find that in, in various relationships we find ourselves in. For instance, I don't think it's a, a hidden, uh, I haven't hidden this from anybody. I've been coaching football for the last few months. Well, our last game was yesterday, and I'm glad. <laughs> <laughs> Those kids were driving me nuts. But it was a lot of fun. And, and there was one kid on my football team who had a brother, and, and it has a brother. And the kid showed up to the first practice as a third grader, a tiny little kid. He's skinny as a rail, and, but he really wanted to play football. So his mom and dad signed him up. He's going to play football. And he was kind of a package deal with his brother. And the first few practices, I had my older sons who play at the high school. I say, hey, come help me coach these kids on some of the line stuff, some basic things. And so they showed up. And this brother was there of, of this kid that, that's skinny. The, the kid that's skinny, uh, his name's Connor. And his brother's about 17 years old. I think he's 17. And my oldest son goes, oh, he's to school with me. He's up at the high school. And he's about three feet tall. And he's got some disabilities. And he, but he loves football. And so... When you're a coach, there's a couple things that, that run true if you're a good coach. You want to win, right? Winning's not the end game. You know, you want to, at the end of the day, you want to have won the football game. But you also understand that you're teaching some other skills. But as you go through it, and you get, sometimes your mind gets set on, this is, we're going to accomplish the mission. Well, this other young man named Dom, he would come to practice, and, and he'd come out, and, and he was sort of a distraction for a while. And I'm like, man, it's, you, you got to be nice because you you're the coach and, you know, everybody knows I'm a pastor where I'm out from. I tried to hide it, but they found out. Um, and then when they know you're a pastor, they watch you, right? And it's like, ah, oh, nah. but, but I, I, I'm coaching. I was like, okay, Dom, all right. And he'd come out of the beginning of practice and give him high fives. And he's like, all right. And he, you know, and he's, he's delayed enough. I can't understand a word that he says. And, but he, he, the one thing I, when I get in those situations, I find it easier if I can, with, especially with kids, if I can just get them to scream. Because then I, okay, everybody's happy. And so when he would come out to practice at the beginning of practice, I'd say, all right, Dom, it's time for football. Ready for football? Yeah! And that's when you know, give him high fives and give everybody high fives. And then his parents say, all right, Dom, come off the field. And it's all right. And eventually, though, Dom sort of won me over. He was kind of a distraction for a bit. And I'm like, ah, we got a, a mission to accomplish here. He really won me over at the second to last game. He wanted to be on the sidelines the whole time. And his parents, if you know parents, they, you know, they're like, get over here. They're they kind of keeping him away. And I said, you know what, bring him over. He's going to help me coach. And this is the second last game that we had. This was last Tuesday. And it's a team that had beat us. And I don't like losing. And so I'm trying to get my kids ready to play. And they are sucking in the first half. Just terrible. And you know as a coach what kids are capable of doing. And when they're not doing that, it drives you nuts. And then when they excel, you're like, wow, this is really great. But they're not even doing what they're supposed to be doing. So I call a time, time out. Walk out on the field. Get over here. Because they're, they're running backwards. And you don't teach. To, you don't run backwards. You run straight across it, up into your gap. That's what you do. And I'm telling them, you guys are driving me crazy. And I'm telling them, and these little kids are looking at me. And I was like, and I go, you should run up field. End of timeout. Go run. Go play. And I'm walking off the field, and everybody, of course, knows, because I'm fairly animated. Everybody knows, oh, the coach is upset that the kids aren't performing. And I'm walking off the field, and I go over the field, rascal kids, and there's Dom. And he looks at me and says, the ball! <laughs> and I realized God put this kid there for a reason. There's something more going on here than just football. Sometimes in life, there's purposes and reasons that people come into our lives and cross our paths ever so significantly, or insignificantly sometimes they may seem. 
We're about to see a guy in the Bible that has very little real estate in the Bible, but has some of the deepest theological meaning behind the interaction he has with Abram. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to chapter 14 in the book of Genesis. We're going to pick up where we left off last week. If you don't remember last week, Lot had gotten taken away because uh, the kings had rebelled and, and they came and ca- captured him. Abram went in, gathered his men, went in and captured, re- re- took, defeated the kings, took Lot back and is bringing the stuff back. And there's going to be the king of Sodom there. And there's a new guy that we're going to talk about. Beginning in verse 17 of chapter 14, the book of Genesis. After his return from the defeat of Shirt uh, the kings and the kings who were with him, the king of Sodom went out to meet him. Speak, this is of Abram. We went out to meet Abram in the valley of Sheva, that is, the king's valley. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was a priest of God most high. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram by God most high, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be God most high, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And Abram gave him a tenth of everything. And the king of Sodom said to Abram, Give me the persons, but take the goods for yourself. But Abram said to the king of Sodom, I have lifted my hand to the Lord God most high, possessor of heaven and earth, that I would not take a thread or sandal strap or anything that is yours, lest you should say I have made Abram rich. I will take nothing but what the young men have eaten and the share of the men who went with me. Let Aner, Eshcol, and Mamre take their share. And so, a pretty short section. And, and really, the mention of Melchizedek's really short. And before we get to that, I want to deal with this last part here, because there's really kind of two things going on here. The king of Sodom offers for Abram, you just take everything. You're just leaving the people, you take all this stuff. And Abram refuses. And this is an, there's an important lesson in this, because if you remember, we go back to chapter 12, when, or, or chapter 13, when Abram and Lot split. There's this weird statement that says, the men of Sodom were great sinners against the Lord. So here's the key, the representative of that, and here's Abram, and, and he's talking about this. And, and, the, and the king says, hey, just you keep all the stuff, just give me the people. And Abram refuses, and he cites God. And for us, it's important to look at what's going on in that piece, that, just, that, that short chunk of relationship. What, what is Abram seeing that we need to be aware of? And I, I just really have just three quick things just on that. The first off, is we have to understand who the king of Sodom is and who he's representing. And this, what this would do is set up a some, somewhat of a, an indebtedness of Abram to him. Because Abram says, I don't want it ever to be said that lest I, you, know, you made me rich. And so there's this understanding of when we enter into that kind of a relationship, there's an indebtedness. And Abram is going to avoid that indebtedness with this guy. You know, ultimately, he's, he's avoiding a statement that later on uh, the king could claim, well, you have all that stuff because of me. And the king could build in this, and it could create a problem for Abram later on. So by, by refusing it, Abram avoids that. The second thing that I see here happening with that is, is this association. Um, Abram is saving himself from an outside perspective that he's associated with the Sodomites, thereby giving his approval of, of their actions and whatever they've done and whatever they will do. And so Abram avoids that, that really appearance. Now, now, we see this happening right now around us. This is where all the baker stuff goes on, and the bakers have refused to do things. And, and so that, this, is what, this would be the same thing that they're citing. And this is what Abram's citing. It's, no, 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 it, it, this, I'm going to avoid this, even this appearance of, of me being in a relationship with you as the king of Sodom, because they're sinners against the Lord. And so what we also can start to picture here is why did Abram even go into the battle? We, we start to see, well, he went in for Lot. There was nothing. It was his purpose. He went in to save his nephew. It didn't have anything to do with these guys. And so by doing this, Abram is able to separate himself out and say, no, I'm not with them, so others around don't see it. And because Abram's not with him, that means as Abram is, is now the one that God is, is choosing to build a nation through, and we look at this and say, well, then they're not together. Which is an important thing. And finally, the last thing is the later outside influence. Abram's going to avoid that, uh, the future influence from the people of Sodom, based on, on this understanding when you enter into that relationship of, of sort of indebtedness, there's an implication that later on it's going to come back to bite you. And the only reason I mention this is because this is very prevalent today. Not, not, not necessarily with a baker thing, but, but if you have ever been a part of a nonprofit, churches are nonprofit corporations. One of the things that churches should never do, I think most of the churches I know would never do this, you never take a dime from the government. 
because it's always got stuff attached to it. We had Sherry uh, come from Path of Life Ministries and present there. They're a nonprofit, and there is money that would be available to their ministry from the government, but they won't take it. The reason is it's always got strings attached. If you've ever been into foster parent training or anything, uh, every foster parent I've ever known that was coming at it from a Christian perspective has done it to help the kids. But when you sit through the trainings, you realize there's a lot of things that the state attaches to these. When you enter into that relationship, you enter into that. And, and that's what Abram's avoiding here with this. And so if you ever run a nonprofit, you start it as a, as a Christian organization, I would suggest to you, do not get in bed with the government because eventually they will tell you what you can and can't do. And as you become dependent upon that money, their influence on you becomes more and more greater. Now that's almost, it's, it's kind of a weird segue, sidestep in there, but that's in there, and I wanted to make sure I covered that uh, portion of the topic. The bulk of, of this section is really about Melchizedek. But I want to make sure we, we kind of saw what God's doing there with Abram, because it's kind of weird, right, that he would, maybe you don't think it's weird, it's, you know, he goes in and battles, he gets all the stuff, why doesn't he keep the stuff? You know, if we're going to go to get battle for oil, shouldn't we keep the oil? I'd say, you know, that was kind of an argument for a while, that I thought, well, geez, if we're going in for, where's the oil? We didn't keep any. It's to say Abram's going in, but he's not going to keep the stuff. And this is because of this relational piece. And it also, I think, identifies for us really the motivation behind Abram and, and his integrity as it comes to this. But then God sends in this surprise visitor, this, this weird king, Melchizedek, and he's got a weird name in and of itself. But he's, it's this weird circumstance where the king of Sodom goes out and, and Melchizedek is going out with him, and Melchizedek's going to bless Abram. Now, there's really some mystery surrounding. There's actually a lot of mystery surrounding this guy, and, and specifically four things when we look at the mysteriousness of Melchizedek that we need to pay attention to. First off, he just pops into Scripture here. There is no indication earlier in Scripture who this guy is. He's not mentioned in Scripture any, anything earlier. There's nothing mentioned about him. He's not going to be mentioned again until Psalm 110 when David says something about him. The town that he's from doesn't get mentioned again until Psalm 76 where there's kind of this obscure statement about it. And then after that, he's not mentioned again until the book of Hebrews. So this is a weird, he just kind of all of a sudden shows up. And there he is. And, and he blesses Abram. Abram gives him, gives him a tithe, and then, boop, it's done, and he's gone. He just, we don't know where he came from. We don't know where he went. It's this weird pop-in, kind of like in life. Sometimes people just sort of pop into your life, and then they're gone. And, and you, you have these weird encounters, and that's what this Melchizedek, oh, this is some, there's some mystery about it. the weird Melchizedekian pop-in. The second thing is he's from an unknown town. There is no reference point for Salem. There's no data on Salem. It's not mentioned anywhere. As I said in the Scripture, it's, it's really mentioned here in Psalms and then Hebrews. That's it. There's, no, there's nothing archaeologically that can be found of it. There's no other historical evidence. There's, there's nothing about Salem. So here's a guy, who's, think of this mystery. Here's a guy, shows up, pop, we have nothing about him, shows up, pops in. We have no idea where he's from. And then he disappears. We have no idea where he went. There's a lot of mystery around this weird guy. And so we have two elements of the mystery there. The third element is he is a priest. Now, this is a big deal. Now, we're not Jewish. Um, I don't think you are. Maybe you are, and, and I just don't know. But, but, but the, the, we're, the, the priesthood, for what we understand, doesn't start until the Levitical priesthood is established in the book of Exodus. And, and when we see this, it, it, right, uh, uh, Moses writes in Exodus uh, 28, uh, Then bring to Aaron your brother and his sons with him from among the people of Israel to serve me as priests, Aaron and his sons, Nadab, uh, and Abihu, and Eleazar, and Ithamar. And, and ultimately, that is the establishment of the Levitical priesthood. Now, the priest's job, if, you, if you're not familiar what priests are, I'm not a priest, I'm a, I'm a pastor and a preacher. Uh, priests are the mediator between God and man. And so the priests would have a, a responsibility to go before God on behalf of man, offer the sacrifices necessary to cover the sins of man. Prior to doing that, they need to offer a sacrifice for themselves in order to, to deal with their own sin. Then they can offer the sacrifice for the sins of the people. They're the mediators between God and man. And God established the Levitical priesthood through the bloodline of Abram, but that's not to come yet. There is no priesthood that we, we look at. So, so here's a guy who now is a priest, 
on behalf of God, a mediator between God and man, shows up on the scene when there is no priesthood developed yet. That's a weird thing. And, and for us, we, we might just read past it, like, oh, this is just a blip on the screen. That's a big statement. That's a big deal. Who is this guy? Where is he from? And how the heck is he a priest? The second piece, or the final piece of that, is that he has a spiritual position of authority. Now, this is a big dog. He has a spiritual position of authority, so much so that he can bless Abram, and Abram offers him a tithe. Now, we don't tend to think in in Christianese necessarily about the spiritual authority that's attached to positions, because we talk about a relationship, and we've kind of tried to do away with the religion talk, um, because in in our culture, it's kind of a four-letter word. You don't want to be religious about stuff. But there is a religious component to what we do. But when we look at this, the the understanding here is here's a priest in authority who is able and capable of blessing Abram, who is the father. Remember the blessing that God poured out for Abram? He's telling Abram, you're going to be the father of many nations, and all the people of the earth are going to be blessed through you, and Abram is now getting blessed by this guy, which means he has authority enough to do so, and then Abram is offering him a tithe, which you you tithe up, right? We tithe to God. And, And so he's tithing up to the priest. That's a big deal. So we have a guy, we don't know where he came from, we don't know where he went, he's got a weird name and he's from a town that we've never heard of and and is not non-existent in history, who comes in as a priest and there is no priesthood, and he's in spiritual authority over Abram, the father, father of all these nations. If I remember the song, Father Abraham had many sons, many sons had, you can sing along, Father Abraham, or I'll just sing by myself. There we go. <laughs> so we we these this is a big these are big mysteries, right? And, and this is just the pop in. It's just go, Abram's going through life, goes and rescues a lot, and then turns down. Hey, no, I don't want your stuff. And and then boom! But there's this guy, and he just does this Bible pop in. Whoop! There he is, and whoop! There he's gone. Until we get to Psalms, and it becomes a big deal when we read what David writes about him in Psalm one ten. David writes in Psalm 110, this is the next time we hear the name Melchizedek in all of Scripture. I want you to consider this, though. We're in chapter 14 of the Bible. All the magnificent events that have happened on the creation, all that, the flood, all that's happened before, and God's focusing in on Abram, and then God focuses in on, but pay attention to this guy, too. And nobody's going to pay attention to it until David says something weird. And in Psalm 110, here's what David writes. The Lord says to my Lord, sit at my, I'm going to pause there, too because that's important, just in like Jesus quotes that even. The Lord says to my Lord, the Lord, God, the Father, says to my Lord, the Messiah, Jesus. God the Father says to God the Son. So now we hear the conversation, right? You've got to understand the, the play out of what this conversation is David's writing. Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool, or your footstool. The Lord sends forth from Zion your mighty scepter, Rule in the midst of your enemies. Your people will offer themselves freely on the day of your power in holy garments from the womb in the morning to the dew of of your youth will be yours. The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. The next statement about Melchizedek in the Bible comes from David in a, in a prophetic utterance, in a prophetic psalm, talking about God the Father, identifying God the Son, and saying to him, you will be a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. Remember all the mysteries of Melchizedek. There's four mysteries. Where, who is he? Where, where did he come from? Where's this town that he's from? There's this obscure town that we don't know. How the heck is he a priest? Because he's not in the Levitical lineage. Neither is the Messiah. Neither is Jesus. And then finally, he has the spiritual authority. So God then solves the mystery. In the Bible, we go forward, and so we look at this. And say, this is an identifier, identifying characteristic of the Messiah. And so we have to look at these mysteries and we start to un- unravel what's going on here. The first mystery being the pop-in. We don't know where Melchizedek comes from or where he's going to go. And why is that important to us? Well, in Hebrews 7.3, the right author writes, He is without father or mother, speaking of Christ, 
or genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but resembling the Son of God, he continues as a priest forever. What, what he's saying there is, Melchizedek, we don't have a beginning for him. We have no end for him. He's resemblance of the Son of God. If you were here with us a few weeks ago, Bill Deller mentioned the word typologies. And in the Bible, there's typological references. There's things that are presented in the Old Testament that are typologies of, what, of the Messiah. So when Abram takes, his, Abraham takes his son up to, to offer him on the altar, it's a typological reference to what's going to happen with God and, and God the Father and God the Son. And so here we have this typological reference of there's no beginning point, there's no end point, there's just a pop in. And what we look at with Christ is, is there a beginning point? Is there an end point? There is not. Jesus says of himself in uh, John 17 as he's praying to God the Father, I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. The glory that I had with you before the world existed. I don't want to get into too much science. I, I well. You, the statement there is Jesus is there before the creation. That's what he's saying. Before the, everything existed, give me the glory. Bring me back to the glory that my work here is almost finished. I've glorified you among men. Now glorify me. Give me back to the, put me back to the way I was. Give me the glory that I had before it all existed. Something interesting that we have to understand, we have to grasp as we, we consider this, is really the recognition that ultimately, Jesus, is existed, Jesus existed and God exists outside of the creation. And if we don't get that, then we miss a huge portion of it. And even, even those who are intellectually honest and look at scientific data are now coming to the point of, okay, there's something outside that did all of this. That's where you get, you know, there's this philosophy on uh, the matrix, that we're living in a matrix now. It's this big computer program, and there's some uh, a computer programmer out there named Dave Couch who's running the whole show. Right? But that, that's, that, that's, that is kind of a new philosophy that's on the, the kind of coming in, and that's what many of the, the folks are kind of like, oh, well, this, but you don't dare mention it's the God of the Bible because well, it can't be him. But even if you're intellectually honest, you get back to the point of where, well, wait a minute. In the beginning, there's something that started it all. Can we describe that? The only way we could describe that is if whoever that is reveals himself to us. The Word of God is God's revelation of Himself to you so that He can be known to you, so that you can know Him. Jesus Christ is the coming, is the revelation of God in the flesh to walk amongst man, to expose Himself. This is who I am. That's what this is all about. God's, the entirety of the Scriptures, God's revealing Himself and his whole, the whole love story that He has about you. Do we know where Christ came from? No. Unless he reveals it to us, we don't know what that's like. Do we know where he went? We know he was killed on a cross. We know he was buried. We know he was raised. And then he ascended. The closest approximation we can get is what David says. He's at the right hand of God the Father right now. And what is he doing? We'll get to that when we talk about what the priests do. But there's more. That's the, the pop-in mystery. We start seeing, okay, well, it's fulfilled in Christ's pop into the history of humanity. And we have Melchizedek who has this weird name. Something that's interesting for us is we as Christians, now not everybody has done this, right? But a lot of us as Christians, when we name our kids, we look in the Bible, right? And, and sometimes we're not very kind. I have a son named Malachi. If you don't know the Bible, you read it, and his name is Malachi. And we call him the Italian prophet, Malachi the Italian prophet. And, and that has some kingly references and all that. My parents were not so kind. My parents named me Stephen. Now, you know who Stephen is, right? The first martyr. He got killed. What did my parents think of me? You name him after the guy that gets killed in the Bible. And I didn't know that. I knew I was named after somebody in the Bible until I read the Bible when I got older. And I was like, hey, what is this? You kill, you got to name me. I'm the first guy that's killed for the God. What is going on here? You're going to name me, you know. Now, if you're Hispanic, the Hispanics have figured this out. They go straight to the top, Jesus, right? I mean, that's, 
If you're going to have a successful name, Jesus. Now, you just understand, when they're talking about every knee will bow, it's not to you, Jesus, it's to Jesus, the Christ. But I mean, if you're going to have a name that's really like, okay, who's the real successor? You go with David, you know, the King David, that'd be a good one. Or you go, Jesus. I, have a, I remember the first time I saw that. I'm not very culturally sensitive, as you might guess. And I read it as, Jesus, who's Jesus? I thought, I thought somebody who was playing a joke, because I'd never seen it before. And there was some kid, dude named Jesus in the class. Was, Jesus. And then his name was Jesus. But I was, I thought, man, his, you're going to give a name? Give that name. Don't give, now, you might give the name after today, Melchizedek. If you're here and you're going to have a kid, you might, hey, Melchizedek, that's a pretty good name. Now, you don't know what it means. The author of Hebrews describes for us what it means. You can go into the Hebrew itself and look at it, but the author of Hebrews incorporates this and lets us know. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, met Abraham after returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him. And to Abraham, and to him Abraham apportioned a tenth part of everything. He is first, by translation of his name, king of righteousness, and then he is also king of Salem, that is, king of peace. His name is is king of righteousness. He is the king of Salem, which is the king of peace. Who is the king of righteousness and the king of peace? It is Jesus Christ. Even in the name, God is saying, this mystery is resolved. You have to know who he is. He is the king of righteousness and the king of peace. We stand as sinners before God apart from our our, our righteousness that we can only obtain through Jesus Christ. Apart from that, we stand at war with God as enemies of God, but we can have peace with God only through the King of peace, who is Jesus Christ. God, in the midst of this, with a seemingly obscure encounter, points to the way for us to have salvation and stand right before Him. The King of righteousness and the King of peace is the only one. The King of righteousness is the only one that can bring us into peace with God. And the final mystery resolve, or the, the third mystery, I forgot there's four. The third mystery, he's a priest outside of the priestly lineage. And that's important in that the Messiah has to come from outside of the priestly lineage. Now remember what priests do. They serve as an intermediary, intermediary before, between man and God. Now ultimately... There's a simplicity stake with what happens with the priest. They offer a sacrifice for man towards God in order to assuage God's wrath. The writer of Hebrews, I'm going to read this in a moment, but, but those, we have to understand that the blood of goats and bulls will not cover your sin. That's why they had to continuously make sacrifices. Now, early on, they understood this is a picture of what is yet to come. There will be a sacrifice that will cover us for all of eternity. Because the blood of goats and bulls will not cover you for eternity. The author of Hebrews writes it this way in in Hebrews 9. But when the Christ appeared as the high priest of the good things that have come, then though the greater and more perfect tent not made with hands, that is, not of this creation, he entered once for all into the holy places, not by means of the blood of goats and calves, but by means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. For if the blood of goats and bulls and the sprinkling of the defiled persons with ashes of the heifer sanctify for the purification of all of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered Himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Therefore, He is the mediator of a new covenant, so that those who are called may receive the promise eternal, a promised eternal inheritance, since death has occurred that redeemed them from the transgressions committed under the first covenant. Ultimately, the high priest, if you remember I said this, the high priest has to offer a sacrifice to cover their own sins. No man can offer us a perfect sacrifice. Only God can offer us a perfect sacrifice. And remember, the sacrifice has to be perfect, and only God is perfect. So only God can offer a perfect sacrifice as a perfect high priest, and only God can be the perfect sacrifice to cover and be sufficient to cover our sin. Ultimately, he has to come from an outside source. 
that there is no lineage. He's not. It can't be a Levitical priest. He has to be of another order. He has to be of the order of Melchizedek, who we don't know where he came from. We don't know where he went, but he lasts for eternity. Our high priest has to be greater than any man. In the interest, I mentioned I'm not a priest. I'm not your intermediary between you and God. I have a different role in the church. I have a different obligation. I have a different accountability for God for the role that he's called me to. But I am not your priest. Your priest is Jesus Christ. He is the one that allows you, that is the intermediary. He sits at the right hand of God, and he sits on your behalf, petitioning God on your behalf, saying, she's mine, he's mine. They're covered in my blood in this new covenant. They're mine. And you can approach the throne of God through Jesus Christ, your high priest, secured in righteousness and peace because of his work. No man can do this. Only God can. And I look at this and I, I think, you know, it's, it's interesting. We're, we're in the midst of a new covenant with God. And a covenant is, is really just a contract. And this is a contract that we get all of the benefits but pay none of the price. We get all the benefits of this contract that we have with God, but we don't have to pay any price. The price that we pay is coming and recognizing who Jesus Christ is, looking at it and saying, I know who you are. You're the representative. I have to be reborn in you. And that way I can then receive upon me the righteousness that you can bestow upon me. And I can stand forgiven before a holy God. Apart from that, we're enemies of God. And I look at this and I think everybody at one day will find out, that, and we'll get to this in a moment about his name, but everybody one day will find out when we stand before God it, it, what you did with Jesus. The most important question that, that is asked in all of Scripture is when Jesus turns to his disciples and says, but who do you say that I am? Because he asks you that very question, who do you say that I am? And Peter gives the right answer, of course. You're the Messiah. You're the Christ. The Son of the living God. They were looking for salvation and they found it in Jesus Christ. And that's the same thing we're looking for, is salvation that comes alone and solely through Jesus Christ. Our high priest in the order of Melchizedek. Because no man can do this. Only God can. We get to the final, final mystery resol getting resolved is the spiritual authority, and I don't know that I have to go too deep into this. But in Acts 4, we read from the writer, the author there, speaking of, of Peter uh, giving testimony. This Jesus, the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Paul later writes in Philippians uh, chapter 2, Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is the Lord to the glory of God the Father. There is no greater authority that you can submit to than Jesus Christ. As we do this, and we, we, we come to him and we, we look at the spiritual authority that we have in it, it, ultimately, it's very tempting for humans to come in and say, you know what, you need to follow me. Some people refer to it as, I'm going to come to your church, Steve. And I, whoa, 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 whoa. It's not my church. First off, it's God's and you're his priests. I'm just called to this role. Now, there's authorities and, and different, various different accountabilities that go with that, certainly. But the ultimate authority is God's. So what do we do with this? This weird pop-in circumstance, right? And, and I, it's fascinating to me how, how all of this begins and how all of this kind of rolls through. I started today telling you about Dom. His name is Dominic. And, and this, this uh, is slight little guy, he's about three feet tall, probably weighs, you know, seven, you know, not, no, he doesn't even weigh 70 pounds. He probably weighs like 40 pounds. Tiny little kid. I'm sitting there through practices, all right, Dom. And all the way through, he's all right, Dom, you're going to come and you're going to help me coach. And I turn around, there he is, big smile. Ah! You know, it's amazing what God can do with people. And when he brings them into your life, what he'll do. 
at the end of that game against Meade, it was the Meade school, and they beat us every time they played us, um, which I don't like to admit, um, but they did. I went over to the coach, and I said, hey, listen, I'm playing you guys last. On, we had a, this weird game thing yesterday. We play half a game, then we break, and then we played another half a game, and I don't like that at all. But we played the second half of our game with, with Meade. I said, at the end of that, I got this guy. And he loves football. He's 17. He's he, 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 tiny. He can't. What do you think? We put some pads on him. We just let him run a touchdown. And the coach, yeah, that sounds great. And, All right, we're going to do this. And I let the, key, the team know because we had practice on Thursday. We're, and Dom, it, it didn't process. He didn't know that we were actually, you know, we, we had him run. And, and he's got the ball. The ball is bigger than him. And he's running with a ball and he wants to throw it. And we're, no, Dom, you got to hang it because we're trying to get ready for him to run this touchdown. And we're thinking, I, and first I thought, well, we'll start him at the 50. And then I saw what was happening. I thought, we better start him at the 10 just to make sure he gets in there. And so then we're like, okay. And so we got it down and the team knows what's going on. It didn't process for him. He didn't know exactly what was happening. Talked to his mom. His mom's crying. Yeah, this is going to be so great. And so I, I talked to him. Saturday comes. We're standing there. I go over to the coach to make sure he remembers because I don't want this kid getting laid out in the middle of a field. That was my big fear. Is we're going to send this kid around and some really zealous kid's going to bam, knock Dom out. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, we killed him. And so, we, I mean, listen, okay, the coach, yep, yep, the refs are all into the game. Ref blows the whistle. It's one last play, and that's the call. Now we're at the 50-yard line. I'm thinking, we got to move it down because he's not going to make it. Nope, we're going to go from right here. All right. So everybody gets ready, and, and they, they, our quarterback, who's my son, turns, and he hands the ball off to Dom, and they're running. And me, these kids are hamming it up. They're playing it great. They're diving and missing, and, and, and Dom's running, and he's, his helmet is way too big, and it's bouncing all around his face, and he's running with the ball, and he's looking over at me, and, and he's checking what to do, and I got another coach out there helping him, and he's looking, and he's looking, and he gets down to the end zone, and he doesn't know he's made it, and the coach says, spike the ball, Dom. He spikes the ball. Do your dance. He starts doing his dance. Everybody starts dancing on the field. The whole mead side, everybody's screaming and all. Ah, yeah. The refs are out there dancing. We'd just been yelling at the refs a minute earlier. Now they're dancing and everybody's having a great time. And Dom's, ah, yeah. A chance encounter. A kid that initially I thought, boy, what a distraction. But God had something much bigger at work. It just took eyes to see it. Melchizedek appears as just a weird pop-in, but there is so much tremendous and rich value about your salvation that God was working out in the midst of this mysterious pop-in. In our lives, there are things that we have to be aware of and need to be able to see. Can you see what God is doing right in front of you? Sometimes it takes and it requires of us the effort and energy to look. But let me tell you something. There is no mistake in things. God is the king of utilizing every resource. And whatever circumstance you find in your life right now, he is at work. Drawing you closer to him, revealing himself to you. Can you see it? Sometimes it's just a little kid with too big a helmet who can barely run with the ball. And when you ask him about football, all you get is, yeah! But God's doing something magnificent. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, ah, oh, you are an amazing and gracious God. Lord, I thank you for Dominic and sending him with such an awesome message. I thank you for your word, Lord, and this obscure reference to Melchizedek, but how much you have packed in to such a small amount of space so that we recognize you are constantly at work. And Lord, I make note that the king of Sodom was right there and did not see what was happening. But Abram, your servant, did. I pray that we would see what is happening before us. See your hand at work. See your revelation of yourself to us, drawing us deeper. And Lord, in the midst of that, that we would reveal you to others through our encounters with them. And God, I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
Well, have a fantastic week. You have plenty of time if you want to fellowship and hang out. I think there's a bunch of coffee back there. Grab some